So hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our roundtable discussion, Indigenous Movement, Dispossession, Return, and Imposed Borders. My name is Danielle berkowitz Sklar, and I'm a senior in Development Sociology in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. And I'm a part of the Undergraduate Migration Scholars at Cornell. Uh, we are a group of students uh, passionate about studying critical migrations issues through a multidisciplinary lens. And we are working with Inaudi's uh, migration team and Cornell's Migration Global Grand Challenge. So thank you to the Migrations Initiative, uh, the American Indian and Indig Indigenous Studies Program, and the Rural Humanities Initiative for sponsoring this event. So as we begin today's program, I would like to first acknowledge um, the land on which many of us are on today. Um, Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayokono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayokono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on these lands. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayokono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayokono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. It is important to reflect on this, and especially today, as we open up a conversation on borders and indigenous movement. I am so honored to be introducing Jeffrey Palmer, um, who will be moderating the event. Jeffrey Palmer, a member of the Kiowa tribe of Oklahoma, is an award-winning filmmaker and media artist. He describes his work as a multimedia exploration of indigenous people's lives in the 21st century America. He recently completed his, feature his first feature film, N. Scott Mamaday, Words from a Bear, examining the life and mind of the first and only Native American writer to win the Pulitzer Prize for Literature. The film premiered at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival and aired nationally on PBS, series, American Masters. In 2020, the film was nominated for an Emmy in support of the American Masters 33rd season for outstanding documentary or nonfiction films, series, sorry. Thank you so much. And with that, I am passing it on to Jeffrey Palmer. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Um... This uh, interdisciplinary panel and discussion uh, will focus on indigenous movement through archeology, span art, and history. Recognizing the need to understand borders and migration as rooted in histories of dispossession and racism. This round table will focus in particular on settler colonialism in the Northeast and the dispossession of Haudenosaunee peoples to engage questions including how have local histories of dispossession and return been recovered and shared? How has the imposition of borders impacted indigenous communities whose territories extend across the US and Canada? And how does art make visible the violence of imposed borders? To start us, uh, I wanna welcome Kurt A. Jordan, who is an associate professor of anthropology and American Indian and Indigenous Studies at Cornell University. He currently directs the American Indigenous, American Indian and Indigenous Studies program, uh, which is ACE. Uh, his The Gayakono People in the Cayuga Lake Region, A Brief History, will be published by the Tompkins County Historical Commission in December. So let me welcome Kurt Jordan. Thank you, Jeff. If I could have the first slide. Okay, here we go. Oh, okay. So today I'm gonna to talk about how settlers in the Finger Lakes region in particular have conceived of the long-term history of indigenous life in this region. Um, and I think one of my uh, one of my main takeaways today is that they have vastly overstated the amount and character of migration that has happened uh, in the distant past. And I'm going to try and step you through some of the reasons why that happened and some of the reasons why that's really very, very persistent uh, in residents and non-specialists uh, among residents and non-specialists today. 
So I think if you ask many long-term residents, uh, students, um, the person on the street, uh, that what, what the long-term history of indigenous life in this region was like, they probably would say that there had been waves of indigenous migration and population displacement uh, in re replacement uh, through, over time. And their descriptions would probably be pretty reminiscent of uh, you know, what, what may be more generally familiar to people from the British Islands, where you would think sort of of these waves of introduction of people, uh, Celts, Romans, Angles, Saxons, Jutes, Vikings, Normans, uh, et cetera. And many people would also uh, draw on, on local histories and resources to say that the Haudenosaunee or the Six Nations uh, Confederacy that were, that's mentioned in the land acknowledgement were historically relatively recent arrivals uh, in this area. And I think if you, uh, if you press them and ask them where they got this information, they, could, they would point generally to some older uh, canonical archeological publications that are quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, have some age on them at this point, uh, local histories uh, that are written of uh, the region that often draw on those sources, news articles, and, uh, and one other thing is that, that I think plays a particularly important part is roadside historical markers. And there are plenty of them in this region. And a lot of them have uh, uh, really sort of crystallized, uh, outdated forms of archeological knowledge, but they're still out there for people to look at. Oh, I guess, can I have the, can you get to the next slide or is that, does that have to be me? Okay. So a couple of the uh, very central figures in this, uh, in this story are Arthur C. Parker and William Ritchie. Uh, they, were, uh, they were associates and in fact, Parker trained Ritchie. Uh, they both spent part of their careers at what, what was then known as the Rochester Museum of Arts and Sciences and later moved to the New York State Museum. They were both state archeologists. Um, and uh, uh, they, they had a very, very, I think, outsized impact on the way that ancient history was conceived of in, in this particular region. Arthur C. Parker uh, is of, was of Seneca descent on his father's side, um, a, and he actually rose to be the president of the Society for American Archaeology. But I would say that he had his relationships with Haudenosaunee communities were rather strained and contentious, uh, that he uh, acted more like a mainstream scholar, I think, than a community-based one. Uh, and, and Richie was, uh, was not indigenous. So there were two phases. Uh, the first one, uh, Parker wrote uh, a history that had very, very overtly ethnic interpretations of who had lived uh, in this region and, and how changes had taken place. And he referenced directly, uh, I think on very slim evidence, the idea that certain populations uh, were speakers of Algonquian languages and others were speakers of Iroquoian languages. And that will keep coming up in the, in the rest of uh, my presentation. Ritchie sort of started to follow um, uh, disciplinary uh, trends in that sort of started to standardize language uh, in the archeological field and kind of uh, got, got away from some of the more speculative interpretations that Parker had had. But I think that those, that sort of terminology, which is still widely in use today, still suggests that there were major cultural differences uh, uh, that, that succeeded one another in time. So before 1949, which is the date for the invention of radiocarbon dating, Archaeologists who were working in New York State uh, had no real independent way to assess the time depth of indigenous occupation. Ritchie wrote in 1944 that he thought that the total extent of human occupation in New York State was limited to some 16 centuries. Okay, um, and we now know with radiocarbon dating and other techniques that the, the true figure is more like 13,000 years or more. So in other words, he was almost off by a factor of 10, right? So this is, this really was, um, uh, and, and then they also, I think archeologists at the, at the time had the assumption that indigenous life ways were quite static, that the, the traditions were persistent. Uh, so I think that some of this came from the fact 
that in the Eastern hemisphere, you had the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age, whereas in, in this hemisphere, there was really just the Stone Age. And so that, uh, that archeologists uh, assumed that there was just a lot more devotion to, to, to tradition and not much innovation, invention, uh, diffusion of ideas, that sort of thing. Both of these assumptions are, of course, ridiculously problematic, and, and I think you don't have to uh, scratch all that deeply to find that they're, they're quite racist in the way that they conceived of uh, indigenous histories. But that the, the one that I, I find really puzzling is just that they had, that they had no, no uh, idea about the time depth of occupation. Uh, that's, that seems very strange to me. So Parker, by the time he, he wrote sort of this archeological history of New York uh, that was published in 1922. And so he was trying to sort of provide a synthesis of the data that had been generated to that time period. And so by this period, archeologists had found very diverse site types of sites in New York state. Some of them look like they've been occupied by hunter gatherer peoples that were very small in scale, seasonal occupations. Others were small, agricultural villages, and then there were others that were these pretty gigantic agricultural communities of sometimes 1,000, 1,500 people living in longhouses surrounded by maize beans and squash, squash fields, uh, the, the Hodinasone uh, settlements. So how could you explain all of this diversity if you were only talking about a 1,600-year occupation? And the, what Parker basically came up with was he said that there were waves of population replacement. So that these different types of sites represented different ethnic groups and that uh, essentially uh, there had been these, these waves of replacement and the hunter-gatherers were pushed out by the small farmers, were pushed out by the big farmers. And he was very confident about assigning linguistic and ethnic labels to these uh, archaeological phenomenon. You could see this table where he was trying to tabulate some of this information by sort of the numbers of uh, artifacts that fit into each of these components. So you see uh, slightly different versions of the terms I used earlier. You see Algonquian, Iroquoian, representing different language families. There were mound builders that were thought to be uh, ethnically difficult, different. There were, uh, there was, an, uh, according to Parker, an Eskimoan occupation of New York State. And then he had a relatively small number of artifacts that were that he couldn't really fit into one of those particular categories. Probably the most absurd of these is the idea that there was an Eskimo in occupation in New York State. The reason that Parker did this at the, is that there had been finds of slate knives that were probably used for hide processing. And this is an example that's in the anthropology collections in McGraw Hall. Uh, that looked very similar to a tool that was used by the Inuit people in the far north. And so Parker just sort of uh, assumed that, uh, that, these, that there must have been an actual infusion of Inuit people into New York State to produce these things. We now know that these are, you know, probably six or 8,000 years old, and they represent an independent invention of a similar technology. So I think that, one, that was one that really sort of falls apart. But these ideas are still on the landscape. A lot of this has to do with the New York State uh, Education Department historical marker project. Um, many of these were put together. This was in the Depression. This was actually a make work program for scholars similar to the Works Progress Administration or the Civilian Conservation Corps. And so there were a lot of people that did deadline scholarship. There are a lot of errors in these things. Uh, but they also uh, encapsulated the archaeological wisdom of that particular day. So you can see a couple of sites here uh, that, that, uh, uh, that, that, that are still have this label that they're Algonquian, uh, which, which suggests that there was a population here before the Iroquoian speaking Haudenosaunee. And so uh, this one's about a thousand years old and the other one there is, a, is over four and a half thousand uh, thousand years old uh, uh, that it, if you add all of this up it suggests that the Algonquians were here for a very long time and Odin so many people were not not here for all that uh, all that long before uh, Europeans arrived so Richie as I mentioned he sort of uh, was going with some of the trends and the disciplines that were that started to be a little less freewheeling than what Parker was doing 
And so there started to be rules for how you would define and label archeological cultures. Essentially, he took the same things that, uh, that Parker had called these, uh, these different, uh, and it was like first, second, and third Algonquian period, et cetera, et cetera. And he gave them different sorts of names, um, most of which were defined by, you know, there, you can see some lake names, you can see the names of some landowners there, um, you can see some river names, that sort of thing. And that, but he kept one of them, Iroquois, which was to which uh, was only referred to sites after about 1350 CE or so. And that was the sites where it was very, very obvious that there were clear-cut ties between. Uh, the sites of that era and the Haudenosaunee peoples that were met by Europeans and displaced by Americans later. But I think one of the effects of this is, it, uh, is that people look at this and assume that these archeological cultures are the same as uh, living cultures. So in other words, this looks like the Celts, the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, the Vikings, the Normans, et cetera, in, in Great Britain. And Ritchie's 1944 book, I think, uh, really added to that. He had one called The Pre-Iroquoian Occupations of New York State, by which he just meant anything that was older than 1350 CE. But it was, uh, but, but certainly the casual reader, if you don't know sort of the insider lingo about how archaeologists talk about these things, it's very, very easy to misinterpret it as being waves of population uh, replacement. So you can sort of see how some of these uh, these arguments uh, were. I put that picture in for you, John. Um, uh, so uh, we, we all know Dean Snow quite well. Um, Richie in 1928 had been writing about a site that was on the east shore of Cayuga Lake, and he suggested that there had been a Gaikono or Cayuga invasion that had displaced an Algonquian-speaking population. Then Richard McNeish studied pottery types, and he actually he argued that you could see long-term continuity in pottery types uh, and that he, dis he suggested that the Haudenosaunee instead had developed what he, he called in situ or in place. And so there was a, the, the, the dominant lang uh, language was sort of, was there a migration or was there an in situ model? The in situ model really held uh, for a long time, despite the signage that we're talking about. And then Dean Snow, came in in 1995 and sort of resurrected a migration model that, that hypothesized that Iroquoian speaking, Owasco farmers displaced middle woodland, Algonquian speaking hunter gatherers in about 900 uh, CE. So um, what that, what that uh, theory really uh, relied on was that there were gonna be overlapping sharp breaks in archeological patterning. So in other words, you would be looking for roughly the simultaneous emergence of different settlement forms, different pottery styles, different manufacturing methods, uh, the rapid introduction of domesticates. Uh, and so uh, Snow in 1995 basically said that he had that, but basically the empirical evidence, people started to review it and, uh, and take a closer look and publish new materials, and it fell apart very, very quickly. One of the problems was that there were domesticates already present. They were not a new introduction. Um, and then there was another, uh, another issue was that more precise forms of radiocarbon dating called accelerator mass spectrometry or AMS started to date these alleged middle woodland and Owasco ceramic types. If snow had been right, we would expect that the middle woodland types would have all been earlier and the Owasco types would have all been later. But instead, you've got about a 200 to 600 year period of overlap and some of the Owasco types show up and disappear. Uh, you know, it's all over the place, right? So it definitely does not look like the sharp break that, uh, that, that snow, um, uh, snow uh, uh, hypothesized, and there is, you know, there's similarly there are long-term trends in the thinning of ceramic vessel walls that that uh, go across this alleged uh, migration event, and so a lot of more recent scholars, uh, including John Hart and also William Engelbrecht, have questioned the framing. They was said that this in situ versus migration model that it's too simplistic. I think John Hart called it spurious at one point, but I couldn't find exactly where he said that. 
Uh, and they've also questioned the reliance on those rich era uh, culture, you know, archaeological cultures, saying that there's actually a lot of them are, uh, if you look at the sites within an archaeological culture, they're not that similar. There's a lot of difference uh, within it. One last more recent piece of uh, information was a historical linguistic study that was published uh, by Shalachi and, and colleagues in 2017. And so what they did here was they looked at words in Iroquoian languages uh, that shared cognate terms. Uh, and they looked at tree species in particular, which seem to be uh, share cognates. There is Northern Iroquoian and Southern Iroquoian of which Cherokee is an example. There was another break later on where, uh, where Tuscaroras and Nottoways moved from uh, Western New York to North Carolina and then came back again in the 1700s. And there are other splits between north of the lake and south of the lake. So they traced all those back. And even uh, there are some similar cognates in Cherokee and, uh, and all the other, uh, uh, other languages. So they're sort of saying that this is proto-Northern Iroquois, right? So they were looking at all of these splits. They also attempted to quantify when these splits took place. Uh, I, you know, I'm not sure how they got those estimates. And I think that, you know, obviously there's probably a lot of variability and, and, uh, um, and some question as to exactly how accurate those might be. But they, they, they basically uh, um, argued that Iroquoian languages had been present in this region around uh, Lake Ontario and the rest of the Great Lakes where those tree species uh, our, our natural ranges are back uh, possibly as far as long as 6,000 years ago. Okay, and then, uh, or for the, you know, uh, th three and change, right? So uh, there's, there's um, so, so they posited that there's actually been long-term residents in, uh, uh, of Iroquoian speakers and that we don't necessarily have a population replacement at all. So, I think I would agree that uh, with many of uh, with many current scholars that this migration versus in situ choice is inadequate. We certainly can see even here we can see evidence that there uh, has been migration. There are historical documents that talk about people moving over both long and short distances, as does Haudenosaunee oral tradition about uh, about movement of populations. So we shouldn't think that there are just people sitting there in one particular place for all time. And certainly if you start to cut things too close uh, that, that uh, and po posit direct continuities, that can be very problematic as well. So for example, uh, my colleague Jack Rawson has talked about a small site on the east shore of, um, of uh, Cayuga Lake and said that that was in his words, ancestral Cayuga and it's a thousand years ago. Um, can we say that? Um, it, it's possible, certainly, but I think that we probably would wanna say it's ancestral Haudenosaunee possibly would be, it would be much more, uh, co uh, uh, much more uh, co comfortable with that. But when you start to think about things on a larger scale, when you look at some of the, you know, the, the, the scale of the regions that are shown on the map uh, by Salachi in Salachi's study, um, I think that there's reasonably compelling archaeological and linguistic evidence for continuity of regional popula populations at the regional scale, not, not at the local scale. And so there, I, I certainly feel that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite possible to say that the ancestors, relatives, and allies of the Haudenosaunee have lived in this region for millennia, and that the common sense emphasis on waves of population replacement is misplaced and it's really there because of that public history project that, uh, that put that sort of rushed that information out, uh, you know, even when it was out of fashion in archeological cir circles in 15 or 20 years, uh, that it's been out there informing uh, generations of, uh, of, uh, of local people. One other thing that I failed to mention here that I think is an important detail is uh, they went back to about 4,000 BCE. Beyond that, they can't calculate, right? Because there weren't any splits in the language. So that's, they can't, basically their method does not allow them to go any deeper than that 
So we can't really use this method to say anything about the, the you know, the, the previous 9,000, you know, uh, 7,000 years, I guess, of, of known human occupation. So, uh, so I guess, uh, you know, what, what does this mean? Uh, it probably means we need better public education on this. And then I think we have to really be, uh, we have to have to think very seriously about what to do with those roadside markers, which are certainly, I think they get to be kind of, um, you know, they're, pieces of local local pride, right? So it's not something that you can just sort of say, okay, we're gonna cut this down and it's done, but there's a vested constituency that wants to see them stay exactly the same way that they are. But I think we have, you know, do they need a countersign underneath them? I don't know, uh, but it's all worth uh, uh, things worth, uh, worth thinking about. So thank you very much uh, for your time and I'll turn it back over to Jeff. Okay, um, so we're going to move from archeological research to uh, historical research. So I wanna introduce um, John Parmentor. Uh, Jeff is in Jolene Linux. Is Jolene Linux? I think Jolene's there. Oh, I didn't know, I thought John, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so we're moving from archeological to visual art. Um, Jolene Rickard, is a visual historian, artist, and curator interested in the issues of indigeneity within a global context. Um, Jolene is on the editorial board of American Art, a founding board member for the Otsego Institute for Native American Art, and an advisor for the Great Lakes Alliance for the Study of Aboriginal Arts and Culture. She is from the Tuscarora Nation and is the former director of the American Indi Indian and Indigenous Studies Program. And she's an associate professor in the history of art and art departments at Cornell University. So um, her talk is going to be Indigenous Nations and Cycles of Migration and Dispossession. So Jolene. Good evening. Trent Escanahan, Sego. Hello to everyone. Apologies that I can't be in the room. Thanks for that nice introduction, Jeff. Uh, yes, I've got some images here and I'd like to share some ideas around uh, this idea of cycles of migration and dispossession. So I'll get started. How can we learn to see the unmarked and invisible spaces of colonial violence and dispossession within the Americas? Is it ethical to recognize global conditions of inequity without acknowledging one's own responsibility to settler colonial violence in North America first? The occupation of Cornell University within Guy Kono and Haudenosaunee homelands calls this omission into question within the framework of the broader discussion of the migration research project. Migration and dispossession are part of the history of the Americas and continue to be part of the experience of the Haudenosaunee. Cycles of colonial violence are witnessed and resisted by considering activist, performative and material expressions by Haudenosaunee political and artistic voices within the context of this presentation. The Kayakono land that we occupy is at the intersection of the examples that I will share in this brief presentation. According to Tuscarora oral history, the, the Tuscarora nation migrated from, north, from uh, the, north, the northern Haudenosaunee homelands over a thousand years ago to what is now known as North Carolina. We are forcibly dispossessed by the colonial Tuscarora wars from 1711 to 1715 and welcomed home with our Northern Haudenosaunee family in 1722. The Kaikono or Cayuga Nation were forcibly dispossessed by genocidal burnt earth campaign at the orders of George Washington in 1779 and in 2010 began to return to their ancestral homelands. The experience of the Tuscarora and the Cayuga in the cycle of migration and dispossession 
are based on a deep relationship to place and resisting the continued violence of settler colonialism. This resistance is a combination of a synergistic orchestration between Haudenosaunee customary practices, US and Canadian settler law or treaties and innovative interventions. Since boundaries or borders of nation states disrupt centuries old patterns of movement for the Haudenosaunee, the examples that I will share focus on these pulse points. The legal or treaty boundary as paraphrased from the Onondaga Nation by the Onondaga Nation General Counsel, Joseph L. Heath Esquire is expressed as follows. The Onondaga Nation and the Haudenosaunee have never accepted the authority of the United States to make our nations citizens of the United States as claimed in the Citizen Act of 1924. We rejected this attempt and resisted its implementation immediately after its adoption. One second. After, excuse me. <clears throat> the Onondaga Nation and the Haudenosaunee never accepted the authority of the United States to make our nation citizens of the United States as claimed in the Citizen Act of 1924. We rejected this attempt and resisted its implementation immediately after its attempt adoption because we had the historical and cultural understanding that it was merely the latest federal policy aimed at taking our lands and at forced assimilation. For over four, now five centuries, the Haudenosaunee have maintained our sovereignty against the onslaught of colonialism and assimilation and have continued our duties as stewards of the natural world. Three treaties with the United States, the 1784 Treaty of Fort Stanwix, the 1789 Treaty of Fort Harmer, and the 1794 Treaty of Canandaigua recognize the Haudenosaunee as separate and sovereign nations. And so my intent is this afternoon uh, or early evening is to uh, create a visual uh, understanding of the way in which the Haudenosaunee have asserted this point, that we imagine ourselves and express ourselves as a sovereign nation, as sovereign nations, and that in the 20th century, to kind of jump ahead from uh, the, actual, the excellent footing that uh, Kurt has provided, uh, into the 20th century, we've interpreted this space in a number of ways. So in the early 20th century, we encounter specific resistant movements like the formation of the Indian Defense League of America, which has uh, uh, gathered both men and women to uh, recognize that we have the right to move freely in our homelands. And so this is a photograph of uh, the IDLA marching from what is now Canada into the United States in recognition of the Jay Treaty of 1794 in which the United States recognizes this point that we have the right to move freely in our homelands. And so sometimes what we say in our territories is that our horns get caught at the border. And so this border is a border that is recent within our territories. And now we have to negotiate it because it has split our families and our communities. So our communities were forcibly displaced throughout the 500 year colonial occupation that we've dealt with. And in this split, two nation states arose and now our families or nations are split and we have to negotiate this border. And so this organization, the IDLA, was formed in order to not only remind our citizens, remind the people of the Haudenosaunee that we have this right, but it's also participatory. It means that our people embody the experience in this march. And so it makes visible our presence on, on a landscape which is intended to erase our presence. And so the role of witnessing and then documenting and then photographing 
and then making public these assertions has been a strategy by the Haudenosaunee in the 20th century to assert our presence. And so I see three moments where we do this both locally with an international or global intent. The first is when we sent a Cayuga title holder, Daskahe, to Geneva, the former location of the League of Nations, the precursor to the United Nations, to assert our nationhood in 1924. And this, of course, is based on you know, the legislation that was passed by the United States as you know, insisting upon our subjugate citizenship in their nation. Then we see another return of this advocacy in 1977 in Geneva at a World Conference of Indigenous Peoples. And then we see it again in 1992, of course, the marker of the decelebration of this so-called discovery by Columbus, which of course is an erroneous historical misrepresentation that is work that is ongoing at the UN around the United Nations or UNDRIP, which is the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Rights. And the Haudenosaunee have been at the forefront of all of these efforts in order to remind first world nations or, or nation states, you know, the people that participate in all the G summits uh, of our ancient, existence as both a people and as govern and as governments. And so how do we then the question I could the question that indigenous peoples globally continue to assert is how do we create uh, or how do we co-create uh, the spaces, the settler colonial spaces that we're in today, to recognize our autonomy and uh, uh, authority within our own homelands. And so here are a number of actions that were taking place in the 20th century. We see the resistance to this idea of our citizens when coming into the United States as being constructed as aliens in order to be, uh, to continue their relationship with, uh, their, with our nation families. Uh, we see this resistance taking place and the edges of now these like interned spaces that uh, with the loss of our land, the dispossession of our land uh, throughout the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th century, we have uh, multiple strategies to continue to resist. And so in the 20th century, the Tuscarora Nation was one of the first nations in North America to actually stand up and take a, and take a stand against further encroachment by the U.S. government in the dispossession of our territory. And so the, you know, we lost the court case, but what it did is it activated our citizenry to recognize that in our lifetimes, we always have to assert our autonomy as indigenous peoples. And, <clears throat> and so we see now these kinds of performative enactments to remind our citizens, people in our territories and allied uh, citizens of the United States and Canada, that, uh, that these agreements are something that need to be understood and that need to be recognized that are part of an, uh, the ethics of governance. That might seem like an impossibility, but it's something that we need to move towards. And so our people recognize the canon and call our citizens to recognize the Canandaigua Treaty of 1794 through a public embodiment. We carry the wampum belts that signify these agreements, speeches are made. Uh, there's always uh, 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 the hope that uh, the president of the United States will come and affirm uh, this relationship. And, uh, but we continue to do our job or our role. And so we could see one of the things that I wanna point out about these, uh, these actions uh, of which today uh, you're probably more familiar with what happened at uh, uh, the No Dapple or what's going on around the pipeline actions. But very few people actually really understand the ongoing activism that occurred in Haudenosaunee territories 
that were critical and raised the consciousness of generations of uh, indigenous peoples across North America. Uh, the white roots of peace is something that came from the Haudenosaunee territories and moved across North America during uh, the, uh, from the 1970s to the 1980s and was very much part of activating or making aware that the rights and also privileges that indigenous peoples have today are something that were definitely earned and defended. There really isn't anything that any of the settler governments have quote unquote given our people. And so these actions are critical to educating uh, the next generation about what it means to take responsibility to be a citizen of any one of our nations. And so the intergenerational exchange of knowledge is what's key uh, at, these, uh, at these events. And so I share this with you because this of course is you know, a part of my life in that my grandfather, Clinton Rickard, was one of, the, uh, one of the leaders that stood up and created the IDLA. I mean, in the historic record, it's interesting because there's an overt documentation of the men that were involved in the IDLA and the story that was not told by uh, his biographer, Barbara Graymont, is the women that were actually very critical contributors to the IDLA. And so that's work to be done. And there are some wonderful young scholars that are doing that work today. But it's difficult to disrupt the visual narrative of these early images because of the absence of the presence of women in these images. And so I try to balance these images with uh, contemporary assertions because women in our communities today are equal partners in the ongoing formation of what is a Haudenosaunee consciousness. And so it's interesting that the role of art and exhibitions have become such an important part in society at large. The role of the museum has always been important in terms of creating reflection or establishing the way in which a nation wants to represent it itself. And so today, the pulse in museums is to open their spaces up to actually deconstruct some of these representations and to also allow multiple voices to come into the space. And this is certainly the role that the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian takes in that it does try to uh, represent from an indigenous perspective how we understand these experiences. And so for those of you that may have uh, been able to do uh, multitask, you know that this is a quote from George Washington on the role of protecting our lands and this uh, collaborative agreement. But if we look at this closely, especially if you look at it from a legal perspective, you can see all of the ways in which this could be interpreted. And so, and so but within our territories, we try to uh, achieve this idea of respect for the dig dignity and integrity of the other nations and stresses the importance of non-interference in each other's in nation in the business of uh, other nations. And so the two row or gasuenta, which is the term gasuenta is the, just a term for wampum in general, but many people, including myself, use this term to refer to the two row. So this is an ancient agreement uh, that was originally struck uh, between the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch. And uh, we can see in 2014, another enactment of uh, this agreement, which we actually have a language that we call it polishing the covenant chain. We call it uh, sharpening or uh, bringing into focus these relationships. And so actually uh, a paddle, a two row canoe paddle took place, which launched actually in Cayuga Lake and made its way all the way down to New York City. 
as a way of helping us to remember how central Ithaca was to uh, movement and trade in the Northeast, as well as early in the early years, the formation of the United States. And so we live in a critically important historical, uh, uh, a historical uh, place that actually was central to the formation of the modern world in many ways. And certainly uh, the Haudenosaunee and our role in relationship to the formation of the United States is significant. But what's interesting or what's part of, uh, I think a complication around this notion of dispossession and migration is the idea that uh, it's possible to actually displace a people and erase them. And so what I'm suggesting is that that isn't a possibility anywhere in the world. And we should look carefully at the example of the Haudenosaunee, and we can look carefully at the example of both Tuscarora and the Gaikono as a, a reminder that in indigenous communities, we have this real, we have this responsibility for intergenerational knowledge, and therefore we have this very long memory of what our responsibility are to the territories and the knowledge that was formed around the spaces and places that we come from. And so art then becomes another way today for people to open up these spaces and market. And so this purple glow in the detainment center at uh, the three river crossing between the Mohawk nation, the USA and Canada, which is very, which is in around the Akwesasne community at the Akwesasne border uh, is actually an interesting piece. It's a public installation that was commissioned and Alan uh, Michelson won the commission and his solution was to put um, a 3D lighted transparency in the Homeland Security Detainment Center that referenced in a really complicated and artful way, this ongoing and complicated relationship between the Haudenosaunee and settler spaces. The irony of this piece is that in order to really see it or enjoy it or experience it, you have to be detained at the border. <laughs> and, so, and so he's also appropriated a historic document and this is the letter that the Onondaga Nation wrote uh, to the President of the United States in 1924 uh, that rejects the idea that we're citizens. And he imposes this again on the two row. And so once you begin to understand the visual palette of the Haudenosaunee, the relationship of our symbolic gestures you can begin to, I think, appreciate the richness of this artwork. And what's interesting and exciting across indigenous communities globally, and I think you could make this case globally, is that it's this interest in the historic record and activating it in contemporary art. And so uh, we see this, so for instance, in a case like this, the uh, proposal and then installation by Hannah Klaus, who is also Mohawk, in the uh, lobby of Queen's University Law School, which of course is just outside of Toronto. Now, what's interesting about this installation, and I studied it for a long time, and I kept saying, you know, there are some wampum belts here that I really, have never seen before. And, and then the artist said, yes, I created new wampum belts. I innovated. I decided that it's time for us to begin to continue to mark our spaces in this diplomatic way in these gestures. And so I thought that's a really important thought coming from uh, an artist and then in particular in this space. Now, one could argue that what is our legal standing 
in both settler governments. And so the question for me becomes, does it mean that we shouldn't mark our spaces? Does it mean that we shouldn't send reminders that there's actually, dare I use the Omi Baba expression of a third space in North America that is actually a first space? And so when we begin to recognize that indigenous peoples have a deep and profound responsibility to place, but that also allied scholars and settlers share it should share in their responsibility to our space, I think that this will begin to change a certain dynamic in the way in which not the way in which America expresses itself in the world. Because if America can begin to the to recognize its responsibility to its colonial actions against indigenous peoples, I think that would begin to help change a dynamic globally. There, there's an opportunity for, I'm always optimistic that so there's an opportunity for leadership in this way. So here again, referencing the signs that Kurt represented and the very problematic sign that spoke to the Cayugas after their forced dispossession, 17, by the Clinton-Sullivan campaign, their in return in 2010 was met with this sign from the Upstate Citizens Group organization that they didn't want to see Cayuga people coming back to their homelands. And so how do we begin to think about this? And so I thought I needed to mark the space uh, and bring the discussion into another uh, group of people. So I began to create uh, expressions around this, artwork expressions around this. And as I began to develop more of a relationship to the people, the Cuca people that were returning to these territories, uh, I was able to then document more intimately some of the interior spaces of the Cayuga Learning Center. These images are special to me because it's actually very few images that exist uh, that exist that document the center. They're, they're, you know, in this one, actually the time of year that it's demonstrating is harvest. So it's this time of year. And then we see, um, another piece uh, that marked their return. Uh, this is in collaboration with the Guy Kono faith keeper, Steve Henhock and uh, Tuscarora technologist, Waylon Wilson, where we created a narrative with the canoe as the metaphor for the water, the metaphor for the lake. And then we create a narrative around the lake that tells the story of the Cayuga, uh, both historically and then that point of rupture. And so the use of this sort of fluorescent and almost violent color is part of this moment of change for the Cayuga. And then the blue at the top of the lake is the beginning of calmness of the Cayuga moving back into this space. And so um, I was lucky that I was able to uh, have a friend that had a 700 year old dugout canoe just in his garage that I could use in order to make this piece happen. And you can see here, I'm trying to integrate the language with the symbolic gestures of the Haudenosaunee. And then I also had the displeasure of documenting the destruction of this building and these spaces because of an internal rupture within leadership where the US government did interfere in their territories. And so this is the result of it. We see the disrupt, we see the destruction of the built, the spaces that the people that are trying to return uh, have to endure. And so what's interesting though, in this photograph, what we're, what you're looking at is one of the first times in over uh, 200 years that we see 
a number of title holders from the entire Cayuga Nation gather. And so it's in, and so I, I, I think there's more thought to be had around uh, these cycles of dispossession and destruction, because I would argue it brought their people together. The people who had to cross the, the what they call the medicine line or the border that crossed us and it brought them back into these territories in order to affirm their relationship to this place. And so the Tuscarora and the Cayuga. And so this piece is actually a recognition of the way in which our lives are entangled because the Tuscarora weathered, we would say for over a hundred years on the southeastern door of the Cayuga Nation as we stabilized after our forced dispossession from North Carolina. And as we came north and then found our way to our current home, which is in Western New York in the Seneca Territory, Western Door, uh, one of the things that the Tuscarora innovated on is actually beadwork. And this kind of work by many art historians is considered arts of survival because we made this work that is based on our oral histories, but at the same time, it's based on deep teachings. And so we have an affinity to the bird, which is part of Gnonio, just part of our teachings. And at the same time, you know the story of the extinction of the carrier pigeon. And so, I, uh, excuse me, the passenger pigeon. And so I was describing this piece to Faithkeeper Henhawk and he immediately began to sing pigeon dance. And he said, you know, I always wondered why we sang pigeon dance. And I said, well, this is the bird you're singing it for because this is the bird that was part of our world at the time that we were singing these songs. And so this piece is currently on view at the Johnson. We didn't have the auditory space to include the pigeon dance song with it, but in a perfect world, it would have had a sound cone with pigeon dance song animating the distance between the innovative use of these settler materials to create the expression of the bird but while acknowledging the, dis the extinction of this species. And so here it is, we're all living in this space, Cayuga, Tuscarora, Haudenosaunee, allied scholars, settlers, we're all living in this space together. And I think that the notion of dispossession and migration, the relationship to indigenous peoples is something that uh, we all need to understand in order to find our way to avoid further rupture like this, uh, what's happened with the passenger pigeon. So I'll leave it there. Yawa. Thank you, uh, Professor Ricard. Um, so now I want to move into historical analysis. Uh, John Permenter is an associate professor of history and affiliated faculty in American Indian and Indigenous Studies um, here at Cornell University. Um, he researches Indigenous North American history. In the spring of 2022, he will be co-teaching History 1820 U.S. Borders North and South with Professor Maria Cristina Garcia. Um, his talk is The International Border at Akwesasne, Problems and Prospects for Decolonization in the 21st Century. Professor Parmenter, thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, okay, so if I could get the slideshow, that'd be great. Um, all right, okay, good. Thanks everybody for coming and thanks to my two uh, folks who went before me for setting up the table so nicely for what we're gonna talk a little about today. We're gonna look at a case study here of a particular space um, and the problems that have, the international border has created. And I think the interesting thing here is most of us confront migration in the news media uh, on more of a global scale, okay? We look at sort of human migration as a really fraught legal and social issue, something that's uh, brought about by poverty, war, famine, and oppression. 
And one of the things we see in today's world is the explanation for this is often um, a failure of post-World War II decolonization. Decolonized people around the world are excluded from uh, many of the um, economic and political benefits of the first world, and they're on the move in search of a better life. What I'm going to talk about today is a case study um, that addresses some of these broader issues, but in an indigenous population that awaits decolonization, the Mohawk community of Akwesasne, which is about a four hours drive north of Ithaca. Okay. Is it the, oh yeah, okay. So, so here it is, okay. This is a, a map of uh, the Mohawk community of Akwesasne. And I often hear people say that, you know, Akwesasne straddles the U.S.-Canada border. You'll hear that phrase over and over. And I think that's a misrepresentation of what actually happened here. The Mohawk community was there and the international border was imposed on top of it. Okay, by subsequent settler nations. The impact of this, um, particularly in the post 9 11 context in which this border has hardened to a great extent, um, really, I think, reveals the deep impact that settler colonialism can have on Indigenous people. Settler colonialism being the kind of colonialism that seeks to divide, displace, and in some cases destroy an Indigenous population in order to replace it with a settler society. So at Akwesasne, the border that's created by the 1783 Treaty of Paris between Great Britain and the United States, that is surveyed in the 19th century without regard for the Mohawk community, they literally ran the survey chain right through the center of the community, um, has really come in the 21st century to mark the extreme of the power of Canadian American nation states to surveil, regulate, and restrict the capacity of the Akwesasne Mohawks to move freely within the boundaries of their ancestral community. So what I'm gonna talk about today is, is a recent um, legal issue with uh, immigration law and border control. And, and we can really see here, I, I think, how the discriminatory and oppressive practices of settler colonialism come into play and what the prospects for decolonization here uh, might be. And, and when we say decolonization, we're talking really about three things. We're talking about acknowledging and respecting Indigenous people's worldviews, which are rooted in their connection to the natural world, Indigenous people's relationships with the land, with this land, predate by hundreds or thousands of years the contemporary formation of settler nation states, the United States and Canada. We're talking about pushing the state legal apparatus, regulating migration in North America to consider more fully its colonial origins and impacts, and to incorporate more inclusive concepts of individual and collective rights in law and policy. And finally, we're gonna assess constructive collaborative initiatives undertaken to ameliorate some of these colonial restrictions on the ground. Okay, so Akwesasne Mohawks confront the single most complex of about 120 ports of entry spanning the US-Canada border, the longest border between two countries in the world. And there's a myriad of individual issues we could talk about today, but we're going to talk um, about something that happened in the recent past that I think draws out many of these issues quite effectively. In 2006, the Canadian government, the Ministry of Public Safety, authorized previously unarmed Canadian Border Service Agency officers, that's the CBSA, you'll hear me say that again, authorized them to carry nine millimeter Beretta pistols. The order was scheduled for implementation at Akwesasne, where the port of entry existed on Cornwall Island, for the 1st of June, 2009. The Canadian governing agency for the Mohawk community, the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne, the government recognized authority, um, insisted to Canadian authorities that the arming of the border guards be delayed until meaningful consultation with the community could be held. The Canadian government refused a month long peaceful protest around the port of entry. You can kind of see that the gray building in the background of the picture there um, took place uh, throughout most of the month of May, uh, 2009. On May 31st, 2009, 400 community members gathered around the Canadian Border Services Agency port of entry on Cornwall Island, lit six bonfires representing the constituent nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy in protest of the looming deadline. At 10 minutes to midnight, the Canadian Border Service agents in the station walked off the job, citing safety concerns, ironically, safety concerns 
were at the heart of the Akwesasne community protests. In addition to what they saw as a violation of their sovereignty, the presence of armed border guards at a major crossroads in what is effectively a residential area in the community was seen as a recipe for disaster. Jolene mentioned long memories. An individual in the community was shot and killed by a Dominion police officer in 1899, okay, over this issue of the border, okay? So it was abandoned. Canadian Border Services Agency walked off the job, port of entry was closed um, for six weeks in 2009, okay? Canadian government decided in July to take the port of entry that was on the island and move it to the north shore of the St. Lawrence River onto the Canadian mainland, okay? And that's where things have gotten a bit more complicated. So the border station you'll see on the map was initially on Cornwall Island, okay? Um, on the green space there, which is part of the community, but it's north of where the boundaries are. You can see it kind of zigzags between the area here. Long story short, in 1783, they wanted water boundaries, not land boundaries for the most part. So that's why it looks like that. But then they pushed it up onto the shore in the city of Cornwall, which is actually on the mainland of Canada. Okay, might not seem like a big deal. Most people from Aquasasne in their daily business going between the New York side and Cornwall Island just simply went about their business, didn't bother to cross the second bridge and go to the report at the port of entry. That went on for about two months. And then in September of 2009, the Mohawk Council began reporting CBSA seizures of vehicles on Cornwall Island that were owned by residents of Aquasasne who had crossed from the United States, crossed the first bridge onto the island, but had not reported to the port of entry in Cornwall, okay? And as a result, they were in violation of Canada's 2001 Immigration and Refugee Protection Act which requires all travelers from outside Canada to report without delay to the nearest port of entry. Anyone who fails to do so is in Canada illegally and subject to criminal prosecution. Okay, um, they took people's cars, charged them $1,000 to get them out of impound. Okay, so this creates a substantial burden on people in the community who might want to travel to Cornwall Island for whatever purpose, to visit family, to attend a youth sports practice, the major sports arena uh, in the community is actually on the island, okay? They would now have to go across not one, but two bridges and then double back to get to the island, okay? Typically, wait times to get through customs and back could reach 45 minutes to an hour. 70% of the traffic across that bridge comes from the community. It, it just basically got really congested, okay? Um, in 2014 and 15, I served as an expert witness in a test case that sought to address the question of whether pre-contact Mohawk travel in the region, including that that crossed what the current international boundary is, guaranteed a right of free movement today. The two defendants in the case um, were charged on different dates um, with the crime of aiding and abetting others to enter Canada without reporting to Canadian Border Services. Uh, to, to make a long story short, they basically entered Canada from the United States, dropped off their kids on the island, and then actually went and reported. But Canadian Border Services knew that there was fewer people in the car when they got to the port of entry. So there are surveillance cameras watching everything. So both these uh, women were charged um, with, with crimes. And the attorneys that I was working with were um, seeking um, uh, an Aboriginal uh, right claim to protect their mobility under section 35 of the Canadian Constitution Act, which was basically trying to say that they have a right to travel freely within their community without going to the port of entry and reporting. Um, the decision in the case um, was not successful for the defendants. The judge uh, portrayed there acknowledged that the Mohawks inconvenience at the border as a result of the 2009 shift from its spot on the island to the mainland was very inconvenient and disruptive to the residents of Aquasasne, but declared that the problem was self-imposed because of the community's protest of the CBSA arming its guards and their refusal to permit the reoccupation of the Cornwall Island port of entry with armed guards, okay? The judge 
also applied a very strict interpretation of the particular legal test that's required to prove an Aboriginal right in Canadian law, effectively saying that the contemporary activities of Mohawk people crossing the border for, the, for school, for their jobs, for cultural events, for family visits were sufficiently different from what Mohawk people were doing at the time of first European contact that they therefore could not be claimed as Aboriginal rights uh, under Canadian law. Those are rights that are uh, associated with activities deemed integral to an Indigenous nation's culture and linked to practices that existed at the time of contact. Think about that for a minute. How many of you are doing things exactly the same way your ancestors 400 years ago were, okay? The judge ruled that the imperative of border security concerns outweighed the inconvenience of duty to report for the Mohawks of Akwesasne. And having accomplished this larger objective, he issued unusually lenient sentences for the two defendants. They both got conditional discharges with six months probation. They could have been in jail. They could have been facing multiple thousand dollar fines. But he basically let them walk, okay? Which, so it's a very interesting kind of decision. Um, by invoking national security as the overriding rationale, uh, Judge Griffiths obscured uh, the ongoing injuries to the Mohawks of Akwesasne that resulted from their community being divided by the international boundary. So what's happened since? Okay, um, in the post-2015 landscape, what's very interesting is that the Mohawk Council has been very persistent in engaging in negotiations with Canadian Border Services about how to mitigate the impact of this relocated port of entry on community travel. Wait times and reporting requirements remain a substantial inconvenience for a community in which many families are composed of people born on either side of the border. And it's a source of frustration that can intensify the atmosphere of any border checkpoint and lead to uh, confrontations. If you've ever watched the first um, eight or 12 minutes of the movie Midnight Express, you'll know what I mean, okay? I guess no one's seen that. Well, you should really watch it, okay? <laughs> Um, it's, it's really worth your time, okay? Um, some parts of the community are connected only by water, even the, within Canada, okay? So many people in Akwesasne have to cross the border multiple times per day to do things that normal people do. And I think one of the most <coughs> excuse me, instructive things here to think about is compare it with the experience of non-Indigenous people. For non-Indigenous people, border crossing tends to be kind of an infrequent thing. They don't have to leave their home country to travel to another part of their home community for food, work, social events, the grocery store. Their grocery purchases are not subject to inspection by border agents. They don't confront situations in which tradesmen, repair technicians, and even delivery personnel refuse to provide service, owing to a reluctance themselves to pass through toll booths and ports of entry. They don't have to factor into daily trips for routine occurrences such as a child's sports practice, the anticipated wait time at a port of entry, and remember to bring all their papers and paperwork, okay? It's been a very interesting and long drawn out battle. And what's fascinating is that Canadian government really did very little to respond to community concerns until, of all things, the COVID-19 pandemic, okay? At that point, something very interesting changed. And the Canadian government basically relented on a very kind of minor but interesting sort of issue here. They decided in November of 2020, with the reduced traffic that the closure of the US-Canada border had created, to experiment with something that they called a domestic travel lane. Okay, meaning that, and this actually applied to Native and non-Native people, that if you were staying within Canada, if you were on Cornwall Island, and you wanted to go back to Canada, okay, you'd have a domestic travel lane set aside specifically for yourselves, and you wouldn't be sort of caught up with the international people who had transited through the US and were gonna double back, okay? Um, so they put this in place in November of 2020 to try and sort of um, address issues of congestion at the border, wait times, and it's actually seemed uh, to be working fairly well. The lane is open from seven in the morning to 11 p.m., seven days a week. The trial period, as far as I understand, is still ongoing, okay? So it's kind of an interesting moment here that resulted from years of, um, I guess you could put it, collaboration 
between uh, the Mohawk Council and the Canadian Border Service Agency. Uh, it was intended to address the question of Indigenous movement within the community in a small way to improve people's access to goods and services, essential goods and services. And what's really sort of fascinating to me is the paradoxical kind of situation here where the pandemic closed the border uh, up until very recently, um, yet Mohawk people were exempted from it. People in the community from the very beginning were assured that they would be allowed to cross the border without, for essential or non-essential purposes, okay, um, without any requirement for COVID-19 testing, quarantine, or vaccination requirements, okay. During the pandemic, both the Canadian Border Services Agency and the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol officials have maintained in day, a weekly contact with authorities um, in Canada and the United States on the, on the reservation. Um, both have been quite consistent about preserving the exemption on border crossing restrictions for people who are from the community. So it raises an interesting question. Um, you know, does this once in a century public health crisis really create kind of an opening for us to start rethinking um, bigger issues that are going on here, to think about ways in which this could actually be further decolonized? What are some of the ways in which Mohawks of Akwesasne could be permitted to move more freely across their own territory um, while also, you know, observing the law, okay? There's a number of interesting things. I'll just touch on a couple of them here um, in the interest of time. Um, probably the most important one would be for the government of Canada to recognize the free passage rights that are afforded to Indigenous peoples in Article 3 of the Jay Treaty, okay? The Jay Treaty was signed between the United States and Great Britain. Canada refuses to recognize the treaty, saying it was abrogated by the War of 1812, the War of 1812, and the fact that um, after Canada achieved uh, dominion status in 1867, the treaty was never implemented by Canadian legislation. So there's a big differential between the rights of Indigenous people in the United States to cross the border and the rights of people uh, in Canada. Okay, um, Canadian born indigenous people um, who do not hold US citizenship, but who can demonstrate 50% ancestry can enter the US freely for purposes of employment, education, retirement, or they can even move there. Okay, Canada does not permit the reverse to happen. Okay, and this creates all kinds of issues for families whose uh, just by birth are uh, considered uh, citizens of particular nations, even though they may not recognize it themselves, child custody and visitation issues of divorce, all kinds of things. People with something on their criminal record, um, this J Treaty solution would be a very uh, large step toward improving things here. Okay. People in Akwesasne have asked for collaborative relationships, agreements with CBSA and Customs and Border Patrol to create something that you might seem very straightforward here, a machine readable tribal ID card, okay? That is compliant with Western Hemisphere travel initiative requirements. That would help, okay? Um, the Nexus program that permits pre-screening of low risk, frequent border crossers to get across the US-Canada border is another thing people have talked about, okay? Um, people have talked about telephone and video reporting. Could we just basically cross from the U.S. into Cornwall Island, go to a video station, pull up like at a, at a bank drive through or something, report our crossing on screen and say, see you later. Okay, we do that in other parts of Canada, not here. Okay, so there's all kinds of creative ideas and interesting things going on. And it's, it's an interesting moment to me because you saw the Canadian government give an inch here, okay, in the middle of the pandemic. And we'll see what comes of that um, as time goes on. But I'll stop there because I know people want to ask questions. And thank you. Okay, uh, so I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Jordan, Dr. Permentor, and Dr. Ricard uh, for this inter interdisciplinary panel and discussion on Indigenous movement through archeology, span art, and history. I mean, I think we should be talking about these issues every month, um, but uh, we are um, you know, celebrating Native American Heritage Month. And so these are very, very important discussions that I'm sure you have questions about. I also wanna thank uh, the Migrations Initiative 
the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program and the Rural Humanities Initiative, and also Eleanor Painter for uh, helping uh, put this panel together. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Yes, thank you. I just want to say thanks so much. I'll just say if you want to ask questions here, please know that we're also recording the session online. We have a few questions in the chat, but we can certainly start with questions from the audience here if you'd like. Okay, sure. Uh, any questions in the audience first? <laughs> okay, well, why don't we go to the chat and then maybe we'll, oh, here we go. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, Hi. Yes. Um, thank you for your talk. You're welcome. Um, I, I, I have run into, uh, it basically, is, I'm wondering I'm wondering if this is part of, of the issue. I've seen the sort of um, Native American travel IDs that exist before. Is that something that's being, that has already been implemented at the Akasasi border and just isn't relevant there? Because I know that that allows for easier paths. Are these state issued ones that these you're talking are, about? These are Canadian. They're Canadian issued. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, Where did you see those? Uh, someone from the US. Interesting. Okay. So in this particular case, um, that's not a Canada wide solution at this point, I don't think. Um, that must be something that's local to the Yukon. I've not seen. The, the, the community people at the people at Akwesasne that I'm familiar with have been arguing for this for, for years. Um, to my knowledge, they have not been allowed by the Canadian government to enter into a relationship with a company to produce them, okay? Yeah. Ironically, the United States has been much more supportive of this um, with the U.S. side of the community. Like, the, it's ready to go on the U.S. side, but the issue is if the Canadians don't recognize it, it's no good. So, um, so it's very interesting to kind of see how that's worked out, but I've not seen um, that that has worked um, in this particular case yet, okay? And I think it's a lot of it has to do with the, um, the CHIP requirements for the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative that are all required to do, but it's, it's complex, it's expensive, and contracts have to be negotiated to produce them, and I don't think it's happened here. Um, Haudenosaunee uh, also used to travel on their own passports. Um, they printed them and made them themselves. Um, that worked for a while. Um, in the post 9-11 context, it's worked less often, uh, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm going to ask a question that's for fantastic talks. Um, I appreciated all of them. And I had a question for Kurt, um, and maybe I came in late, so I did come in late, so maybe I missed it. But at one point, you referred to the common sense um, understanding of waves of migration. And I wondered what it was that made those theories common sense. And I'm thinking, you know, Frederick Jackson Turner and all of the wave theories we have in social science, particularly the biggest modernization theory, Marxist stage theory, you know, there's a common sense, as you say, sort of idea of evolution, sort of like different waves coming in that somehow surpass the past one. And I wonder if there's work that that common sense understanding was doing that you think might have been politically shaped by you know, social science understandings at the time, or, or how did it become common sense other than that it was proposed by a couple of people who yeah. become more advanced? Yeah, no, I think it, it definitely dovetails with uh, with uh, with all of the things that you were you were mentioning there, and certainly there is a sense that there, you know, that the hunter gatherers were first, and they were pushed out by the farmers, and and if, it definitely does it definitely does political work because you know we're you know then Americans are just the next stage in that with with a more efficient uh, form of civilization and subsistence. So I think I didn't say it overtly, but this is definitely I think that there there you know what what um, Tuck and Yang would call a settler move to innocence. You know that as soon as you can sort of establish that there was one migration, then you know it's just like you know oh, you guys just pushed other people out anyway. So what makes you any different? Uh, what makes yeah. us any different than you? 
Uh, but you know that that that's obviously if you're talking about thousands of years, uh, you know, ten thousand or more years, that that's um, of of continuous residence. That's that's a very different order of business. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the room? I guess. Uh, John, and it was in your talk. Um... There was like a lot of entanglements that were occurring between people, policy, uh, technology, and infrastructure, and this kind of vertical movement that's happening um, in Upper Sesame. And I, and I remember going to the res as a kid, and even now seeing this horizontal movement of these large industrial ships heading through the St. Lawrence River. Mm -hmm. How do you think um, that kind of industrial um, migration pattern, as well as the, the Upper Sesame community migration patterns and movement pattern, are kind of being um, understood in a way that they could be almost paired or partnered together because these industrial ships kind of have like a relationship to the land in the sense that they're like weathering away at our borders. Um, mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you have any like insights or opinions on that. Yeah, I think it's a very important thing um, to, to understand that the history of this community has been deeply colored by the presence of industrial development after the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway. So the St. Lawrence Seaway opened, large hydroelectric power dams are put in place right close to Aquasasne. And the pollution that comes from those has effectively, um, you know, effectively killed a lot of what was a traditional kind of lifestyle where people very rarely left the reservation to eat, uh, to get the food they needed and whatnot. Okay, because you could fish, you could hunt, you could raise livestock, you could, you basically could be pretty self-constrained. With the poisoning of the environment and the loss of access to resources that that created, what kind of became interesting in the 1970s and beyond was the border itself for many people became a kind of resource, okay? Um, moving goods of particular kinds uh, across the border um, has had a, a very sort of interesting recent history in the community. Um, some of it is um, illicit. Other parts of it, uh, there's arguments about particular goods that, that should be seen as legal that are moved without paying taxation on them. Okay, so it becomes sort of an issue where um, the border itself in the community um, has become and remains for many people a kind of resource in and of itself. And that has really sort of triggered a lot of post 9-11 security concerns, okay, where the community is seen as, you know, a place where Canada is exposed to the evils of the world, okay? Um, and I'm speaking mainly from a Canadian frame of reference here, but the, the, the fact that this is a hole in the border, uh, a space that's not particularly well policed. And I think that has really sort of been a challenge that people in the community have had to face in their efforts to get some of these impositions mitigated. But yeah, I mean, the, the double time on the bridge um, is something that really, uh, when you just sit and look at the statistics of the wait times, uh, it's just incredible how this affects people's daily lives. So, yeah. I, thanks. We had a question come in that didn't appear in these. So I, I wanted to go ahead and offer that also as a chance to bring Jolene into the conversation. Yes. Um, so the question is, can you comment on the parallels of the settler argument by the Afrikaners in Southern Africa concerning their claim to the land? And I wondered if this was also an opportunity to maybe comment a little bit more on what Jolene brought up about the global possibilities and also these moments of um, exhibiting real solidarity across really wide distances um, at, at these different, you know, she mentioned, you mentioned the different moments in front of the UN. So I wondered if there was perhaps a way to draw some parallels among um, among settler, uh, settler colonial contexts, and then also I'm curious about questions of, uh, of solidarities, I guess. Hi, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I saw the question about the Afrikaners and I've been thinking about that. I think it's really difficult to do uh, comparisons uh, in, in Africa for a number of reasons. Um, one is uh, that it's really tricky who describes themselves as indigenous in Africa and how that's a political uh, discussion. 
and then claim to territory or claim to land, I think is something that uh, is also uh, something that you really have to have, I think, a, like a specific, uh, you know, you have to have a specific thread through on uh, whose territory it is and what this means. But I, I think my point, and I'm sorry that I left out uh, the use of both the language of uh, settler and arriving, because I do think it's important to create a space for peoples uh, who have been forced to be here, that this wasn't uh, their choice, but that now uh, we're all in this together. Uh, and so uh, this question of then how to create um, a space that is, uh, I think, a uh, uh, to create an equitable relationship between indigenous peoples in North America and arrivants uh, who do not want to be acknowledged or do not want to continue to contribute to uh, a kind of, you know, I think Kurt has already called out the work of uh, um, uh, Tak and Yang on this move to settler innocence, uh, where uh, there's an acknowledgement that there has to be a kind of, I think, respectful relationship to indigenous peoples, uh, whether if you're a settler or an arrivant. And, and so claims of land in North America uh, need to begin to recognize uh, this ethical responsibility. And so we can see the complications of moving the argument to a so-called legal discussion because the, you know, there, although as John points out, there has been some gain in legal structures. Uh, it's not something that I think indigenous peoples uh, rely upon consistently. Uh, because it's not our legal structure. We're not fully empowered in those systems. And uh, so I can't really put a fine point on the Africana discussion without really uh, having more information. Uh, but I hope more broadly, uh, just thinking through uh, a rethinking of uh, relationship to place, acknowledgement of indigenous peoples uh, for both settler and arrivants is um, at least a research ethic that we could begin to evoke, especially as scholars from Cornell or within the academy. Oscar, did you want to pull those questions back up? I don't know if you wanted to choose one of the, we probably have time for one more. Yeah, Ellen, can you, my eyes are pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's my, I'm sorry. So, let's see. Well, here's a question that is directed at um, everyone um, from Mohammed Abdu, one of our, um, postdocs here at the Anadi Center, um, who's asking, I wonder whether settlers and particularly settlers of color or arrivants, this is, I'm asking this in, in part in response to what Julian Rickard has just said too. So I'm wondering whether settlers and particularly settlers of color or arrivants who are cast as out of space can actually decolonize and honor the two row wampum, indigenous sovereignty, governance, and the fact that we benefit off of stolen land on Turtle Island as indigenous people are cast out of time. While in the same breath, we as settlers and arrivants stride towards assimilation and pledge our allegiance as hyphenated citizens to a conquistador white supremacist settler colonial structure, US Canada since 1492. So the question being about the, the actual possibilities of of decolonization. And it seems like a contradiction given what W.B. Du Bois refers to as a crisis of double consciousness in light of these different loyalties and ethical political commitments. 
I think this is a question meant to sort of open up discussion for everyone. I think that's its own symposium right there. <laughs> yeah, the round table itself. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a very involved question. Well, maybe if I could follow up on it, I would say that this has been one of the things I've really enjoyed about all of these talks is that you brought in so many different disciplinary perspectives and perspectives from your own experience as well. We've covered a lot of history. I wonder if that's perhaps one way of um, ap approaching the, the idea of um, interdisciplinarity as a one way of approaching the question of um, yeah, decoloniality, what, what methods or what modes of, of knowing are really possible for people to engage? Um, I don't know, maybe it's too big for the, for the last couple of minutes of this discussion. <laughs> Can I build on that maybe with a specific question to John? Sure. Um, I think in one of your last slides, you referred, I think, to the opening up of the um, bridge under COVID as decolonization. Mm -hmm. And so can you elaborate on that? Sort of well, I, I think that was a kind of an interesting moment because, you know, for everybody else, um, the U.S. Canadian border uh, underwent its single longest closure actually since the War of 1812 mm -hmm. over the last um, year and a half, two years. And from the very beginning, people, uh, both the border service agencies on the U.S. and Canadian side were, took great pains to sort of assure people in the community that their ability to pass and repass for whatever purpose was going to be not addressed and there would not be any kind of the same requirements that even people who were doing essential travel who were not Indigenous were subject to. So that was kind of an interesting kind of moment here because they they actually you know, they didn't have to do that. They could have actually impose the same sort of restrictions on essential, non-essential travel. But I think they realized the particular history of this community um, warranted some more attention, okay, and warranted kind of a special case situation because this is single-handedly, this is the most complicated port of entry. Um, there is no other port of entry on the whole border that's like this one where you actually go through Canadian space, you enter Canadian space, and you have to go across another bridge to get to the port of entry, okay? And you can actually, you know, you can, and a lot of people for a long time just ignore it. They go across the bridge and do what they want to do in Carolina and drive back to the U.S. People in the U.S. didn't care. Maybe you were in Canada, so you're going to talk to us about what happened here. But the Canadians were like, hey, wait a minute, you were in Canada illegally, and you got to come and report. So all of that says that basically, in my view, the kind of crazy instance of what we've all been going through for the past whatever how long it is opened up a moment where people were able to sort of say well geez you know um, this is kind of a screwed up situation let's sit here and see if there's a way we can actually address the concerns of the community like I'm sure like that was the first thing I thought of when I heard the border closed back in March of 2020 I said oh my god what's going to happen up there that's going to be just completely chaos but they decided to not make it a reality they just basically let people proceed as things were we still had to report to customs, but there weren't any of the testing or vaccination or uh, quarantine requirements applied. So it was kind of a, I would call it a, a moderate decolonization in that case. Yeah. I guess I might add something. Uh, can, it's okay if I can? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, and I'm surprised that none of us really brought it up because right now ACE is wrangling with perhaps I think one of the most difficult issues um, uh, I think that's emerged within the ethics of any university. And it's the question of um, the use or dispossession of indigenous people's land as compensation for the beginnings of the endowment of universities across North America. And so under the leadership of Kurt Jordan, we've put together an excellent dispossession website. And I think that's sort of point zero for almost any scholar at Cornell to really recognize, know this history, be able to speak to it, and also uh, have an opinion about the university that we're working at and where uh, the dispossession of indigenous land factors into our ethical research practice. 
And so it's not abstract. It's not something that's separate from any one of us. And so when we talk about decolonization, and we have an incredible opportunity to enact a decolonial research strategy at Cornell. And, you know, you could actually work with the American Indian and Indigenous Studies program to raise the consciousness of the university um, uh, leadership to uh, recognize this moral dilemma, which we are all sitting in the middle of. Yes, Ella. Thanks. So I'll offer this maybe as a last question if we then want to okay. um, close out, if that's okay. This is coming from um, Gerard Aching, who asks, he says, thank you very much for these rich presentations. I've been curious about intergenerational communications within indigenous nations. What kinds of stories do you think are most convincing to indigenous youth? Well, I, 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 I'll, I'll take some of it on, but I think, you know, I'll be happy to hear from both John, Kurt, and also, um, I think Jeff. <laughs> but uh, first, we have to think about the fact that amongst Indigenous peoples, the, you know, the largest percentage of our populations are youth populations. So we have more youth than we have uh, people that are middle aged or elders, and and you know this idea of story, I think, is really uh, important because uh, most of the knowledge I see moving through our communities is is embraced through the language of story or through the action of story, and. I guess I'm going to go out on a limb and Jeff can disagree with me on this, but I think that film has and uh, media have made a huge impact in this area. And so the inner, so some of the most successful work that I've seen is actually uh, native youth or indigenous youth working with multiple media platforms, engaging with uh, people in our communities of all different uh, ages. So this idea of intergenerational knowledge could, you know, it doesn't have to be just elder to youth, but it's actually lateral to community to community, uh, different and different experiences. Uh, so age isn't like as much the factor as what's being considered. And it's interesting to me, the technological interface that seems to empower this at this point in time. And so this sort of idyllic, I don't really see this like this sort of uh, maybe older version of, you know, people gathered in a circle sharing, but rather I see this much more uh, interactive media platforms where people are going out and doing interviews, collecting stories, and actually using this process to actually mediate these relationships and then uh, posting online. And so one of my greatest frustrations is that most indigenous people that I work with don't use email. They're just using text and their phones as a way of, you know, creating these experiences. And so I'm, you know, and so there's just this kind of immediacy about it. Throughout the pandemic, it's really been interesting to see the socials that have just in Haudenosaunee territories, the the socials that took place every Friday night and people were dancing in their living rooms and, uh, you, know, you know, having this kind of like exchange, uh, kind of acknowledging the restrictions of the pandemic. And so I think that the pandemic has changed the way that people in our communities engage with technology and media in particular. And it's going to be interesting to see how we begin to, when our communities begin to open back up, they're slowly opening now, uh, what, what's going to happen? And so just this mo a modest take on this, but thank you. Jeff, I don't know if, if you want to comment. Uh, yeah, that. sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, in terms of indigenous youth, I mean, it's, um, this is a really important time. 
um, for uh, untold stories. And um, so two of my colleagues are, and friends of mine, Sterling Harjo and Taika Waititi, you know, just created a, um, a, a series called uh, Reservation Dogs um, that's on Hulu. And they just got their second season, um, which is fantastic. Uh, and it's, it really is a, is a phenomenon in terms of the amount of people, Native youth that are watching, tuning into the show and seeing these untold stories for the first time on their television screens and uh, feeling uh, community um, at a different level, I think. And, uh, and it's really, it's become something that I think, um, as Jolene is saying, is, is sort of changing this idea of communication and networking and understanding. And you're, you're seeing this on social media and it's kind of becoming an explosion. Um, and so, you know, we have a long ways to go in Hollywood and we don't, you know, one of the things I always talk about is this window is open right now. Who knows when it's going to shut? It tends to open and shut pretty quickly. Uh, but right now there are some people getting into places um, like my mentor, Bird Running Water, who now is at Amazon and has a position, an executive position to take in native films. Um, this is going to be really, really big uh, for, for that particular industry, uh, but also for storytelling. And there's so many stories out there uh, that need to be told. And I think Indigenous youth are tap tapping into these stories um, and they, and they want to they see them and they want to know more. So to me, film is just, it, it, it is, uh, it's always been a, a, a part of um, Indigenous life. <laughs> Um, but now we're in control of those stories, and that's the power, I think, that we have uh, to enrich uh, that narrative. So, Great. So thank, thank you, you so Robert. much, all, for, for being here. And uh, yeah. Thanks, Jolene. See you, Jolene. <laughs> Thanks, thank you. Jolene, you can't really see the crowd out here, but <laughs> I should have tried to turn it. We can't turn the camera too much, but That's... you had a, the attention of everyone in this room. Thanks for everybody for their interest. <laughs> So here, so I'll follow up, um, Jolene, I'll send a, a note with other, the other questions that came in and a link to the recording when it comes out. Uh, it's outside. Is it really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I learned that. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Great to have you here. We're talking about California.